I was reading the story of a North Carolina church, young church, um, but was exploding with growth, about 700 people, and um, right across their parking lot, they were sharing a parking lot with a vacant building. And in the middle of this church in a North Carolina suburb, that um, they, were, they were not even considering what that, what that uh, property was and didn't even think anything. And then to, the, to, to their dismay, a adult bookstore moved in right across the parking lot to where this young church, 700 people didn't know what to do. They went to, they went to the uh, city council. They've um, uh, wrote petitions. They did everything they could. And, and this thing was grandfathered in that they, no one could touch it. Can you imagine coming out of a church and you're sharing the parking lot with an adult bookstore. So as the families are coming out, uh, the men were coming out of this adult bookstore. And then they had a brilliant idea. Let's pray. It's amazing how we wait to the very end to pray. So they said, let's do 21 days of prayer and fasting. This is what the article said. They said, as they were praying, praying and fasting, I can't remember if it was around day 15 or day 14, they said, while they were praying, a thunderstorm hit and struck the adult bookstore, lightning struck it, and burned it to the ground. <laughs> it's not over. So the adult bookstore sued them and said, your prayer meeting burned our, our adult bookstore down because you called upon the God, that, that, uh, that Elijah God that sends fire, and you burned down our adult bookstore. It went to court. So, so you have the defendants, which is the church, going, listen, we just had a prayer meeting, which is it's just not our, this isn't us. Because they wanted them to pay for the deductible and the loss of business. Is what they, so, the, so the church was going, it's not our fault. We just had a prayer meeting. We can't control the, thun, the thunder and the lightning. And, the, and, and it was the porn people that are going, you prayed, you had a prayer meeting, like the Elijah guy, you sent the fire, and you burned the place down. And the church was going, it's not our fault, it's not our fault. It's not. And, the, and the judge said, this is what the judge said, the judge goes, this is amazing. I've got a church that doesn't believe in prayer, and I've got a porn people that believe in prayer that's saying you did it. I don't know about you, but sue me. If God sends fire, I believe that God answers prayer. I wish it happens that fast. In 14 days, this happens. I wish some of you that are in here today that, that what you're praying for would happen immediately. Can you imagine you're coming in here and your church is, is faltering with finances and you come to the altar, God, we need a financial miracle and you walk out and there's someone going looking for this bag of money. You're going like, I'm gonna be at every fire in your bone conference in America. <laughs> or if you're sitting in here and you're single and you're going, God, I wanna get married, I don't wanna be a single pastor and you walk out of here, young lady, and then all of a sudden, some guy's going, you know, how you doing? And all of a sudden, it's a miracle, and God works it all out. Someone over here goes, yeah. <laughs> but how many know God seems like answers don't come that fast? You get through those seasons, like Jeremiah, going like, I don't like people, and I don't understand God. You're like John the Baptist, you're going, Question marks have turned into, exclamation points have turned into question marks. And that's where things become confusing, is when we have this script in our mind and God doesn't act according to our script. We pray and then we're expecting this to happen and it doesn't go that way. I think that's what Gary was telling us. Jeremiah had this thought that if I preach this, I'm gonna get a million likes on social media, if I say this, I wasn't expecting that the religious people, it was the religious people, Pashur would throw me into prison and order them to beat me. And all of a sudden, everything seems to go hardly, uh, uh, horribly wrong. So I wanna share with you one verse that brought me through my question mark season, brought me through my fire in my bones season, because that verse became fire in my bones. It was the verse that held me when my script didn't match the journey with God. Let, let me take you to what is called the upper room discourse. This is Jesus' last sermon before he goes to the cross. 
It's John 14, 15, and 16. 17 is that, that, those hallowed verses um, on the, the high priestly prayer. The true, really, it's, it is the Lord's prayer. That John 17, it's one of those moments that God allows us to see the devotional life of Jesus. So we don't touch that. It's, 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 it's hallowed ground. But John 14, 15, and 16 is that upper room discourse. It's John 14 where Jesus begins to say, listen, I'm leaving here soon, but you will not be left alone. I'm going to send you another one. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, parakaleo, the one that would walk alongside of you. In fact, Jesus even says, he said, it's better for me to go because, because now wherever you go, the Holy Spirit will be with you. Whether that's New York City or whether that's in San Diego, the Holy Spirit will be with you. Then he jumps into John chapter 15 when he begins to talk about the new relationship and he calls it a vine and a branch. And he said, you stay connected to me, my life is gonna run through you. He said, if you just begin to understand that the branch, you can't produce fruit by yourself. He says, you need the sap that comes from that tree that pours inside of you that, that begins to do something so deep inside that you can't control. Because it's like Gary said, it's like, it's like you don't have the ability to produce. You can come up, let me just tell you, you can get all the lights and all the instruments and screens and everything else. But if there is, if you're not attached to the life of Christ, then it doesn't work. Then there is no fruit. You have to be. So John 14, the Holy Spirit. John 15, that new relationship, vine and branches. And then John 16, he reprises a, a, some about the Holy Spirit, but ends with prayer. And he says, prayer is like a woman that's in labor. He said, it's, it's, it's painful as you're, tr as you're seeing um, the, the, the labor pains come. But then he says this, he says, when it happens, you forget the pain that you've been through because of the joy of the birth of that child. He says, but it's that painful season. This is how he ends it, and I want to read it to you. One verse, it's John 16, 24, and this is what I want to stay on. It's this. He says, until now, he says, you've asked for nothing in my name. Then he says these words, ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. Come on, I want you to look at it again. Until now, you've asked for nothing in my name. And here are the words, here was the fire in my bones that kept me through my question mark seasons. This is the, this is the fire that kept me when my script didn't match what God was doing. And it's this, ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. It takes three seconds to read those words but how many know it can take three years for it to be accomplished? See, asking is fun or asking is easy. Receiving is fun. But it's the gap between ask and receive that is difficult. Those are the question marks. That's the part that you go, I don't like people and I don't understand God. It's that gap between those words, ask and you will receive. That can be literally years in between there that exclamation points turn into question marks. It's that gap that really messes people up because it can bring anger towards God, depression, hopelessness, and confusion. Because in that gap, we may have thought one thing, like Jeremiah, and even like John the Baptist, but all of a sudden we see something else take place. That gap has literally turned people into atheists. And we have a thing today called deconstructionism because it's that gap they don't understand. Every time I go on vacation, I take a certain eclectic set of books with me. I try to just get books I normally wouldn't read. Just, just whether, it's, uh, whether it's a novel, a fictional book. I was going on vacation and I, took, I found this old book um, on the, from, from the uh, trans world uh, radio broadcast. It was... Corey Ten Boone's broadcast that have never been released, so I brought that with me. Then I brought um, a Lewis, a C.S. Lewis fictional book, and then I brought a biography that reminded me of this. It's written by an, uh, a, a historian that has had um, great impact, Christian man, and his books are amazing. His, uh, Paul Johnson, a British historian, his book on Churchill, um, even on the history of the Jews and the history of Christianity, 
are absolutely amazing. His book on the history of the Jewish people is incredible. But that wasn't the book that I brought with me. I didn't even know it existed. I brought a book with me, it was about 120 pages, and it was called The Portrait of a Genius. And it's about a, the life of somebody that's affected everyone in this room, from your children to your grandchildren and people that we know. It's The Portrait of a Genius, and it was the life of Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, the man who has introduced the evolution theory into, into every level of education, not only in America, but around the world. It was this revolutionary book where Darwin, that many don't understand, did not, did not start as an atheist. He was on his way into full-time ministry. He studied at Cambridge, and he was preparing for ministry, and then realized that he had a greater gift of research than he did for preaching. And, and so what happened was he got on the HMS Beagle, began to make his, his trek all the way to the uh, Galapagos Islands and, and, and began to observe all these micro changes in finches and turtles and everything. And many people think that from that expedition that Darwin turned into an atheist. That's not where it took place. It took place in between ask and receive. I read the letters that Darwin would exchange between his wife, Emma, and you were like reading pastoral letters between a wife. It would be like Pastor Carter writing to Pastor Teresa or Gary writing to Kelly. The, the letters that were not only filled with such, with such love, but filled with God. And I'm reading the letters that, that Paul Johnson put in there. And in the middle of his ask and receive, Darwin has 10 children, and, and Johnson said he was an amazing father. But his littlest one he had fond affection for, his 10-year-old little girl named Anna, had a disease that the doctor said she was going to die. And Darwin started writing to Emma and said, we're going to trust God. We're going to believe for God to heal our little Anna. God is going to touch her. God is going to begin to bring a miracle. And keep in mind, it's not the microevolutionary changes in finches and turtles. It was what took place in between ask and receive that took an exclamation point and punched it in the gut that began to do something in him. And Darwin had the script that God wouldn't touch his Anna, but God did take Anna home. And let me read to you what was written. Johnson said this. He said, the blow was the worst single torment Darwin said in his entire life, exceeding even pain, even the death of his mother. He said he was too distraught to attend the little girl's funeral and never went to Anna's funeral. He never forgot her and he never forgave God for taking her away. Listen to this. Then Darwin said this, the cruelty, this is Darwin's words, the cruelty blew away the last visage of belief I had in God himself. All in between that, all in between ask and receive, Darwin's atheism is because he couldn't process unanswered prayer. He couldn't process it. I don't have time to go through. Read the stories. Isn't it amazing? You take, you take Darwin and science. Do you know this very same thing? Read their stories. Happened to Ted Turner and Steve Jobs. Both grew up in Christian homes, and because God didn't answer the prayer that thought they, that the way it should have been answered. Think about this. Leading men in science, in technology, and in media, and because they couldn't process, ask, and receive, all of a sudden, everything, every vestige of belief in God blown away, just like Darwin said. So what I want to do just for a few moments is I want to talk to you about the fire that came to my bones through this verse. Where God helped me where God helped me to process through because my script didn't match what was in between ask and receive. And it was something that God, that God did deep inside of me. And I want to just share with you two thoughts that maybe could unmuddy the waters and maybe put some hope in some of you today. Because like John the Baptist, maybe, maybe your exclamation point in your preaching is maybe not quite a question mark, but it's starting to droop a little bit as you're getting a few punches from leaders or punches from even pressure that's coming from denominations or from hierarchy or from boards or whatever that may be. 
But I want to unmuddy the waters. I'm not saying it's, it's comprehensive and I'm not saying it's complete. It really is a personal journey of what's in between ask and receive. And I want to just start with you and then end with God and show you what God was doing in me and then show you what God began to even speak to me about what he was doing in between ask and receive. So I just want you to write down two quick things. So get something to write. Let me just ask this because I'm just kind of curious. How many are using, how many are writing notes on your phone or an iPad? Would you hold, hold up your hand? Wow. How many still use a pen and paper? I just want, oh, we do have a lot of old people here. Okay, so let's go through this. Here we go. Let's do this. Two thoughts. Two thoughts. Pastor Carter was kidding me. He was showing me his Bible, and, and I was showing him my iPad. And, and, he was, and, and as Gary was preaching, he was showing me the Bible. I said, I said, that's powerful. I said, but it's too dark in here. You can't even read it. So you have to. So I said, you're going to need the iPad for this one. Two thoughts. I want you to write them down. Maybe it unmuddies the water, and maybe it will help get that, that leaning question mark back to the exclamation point as we process this. Number one. God will never give you something that you're not ready for. <coughs> Pastor Brad, can I just see that? <clears throat> Thank you, Amy. We are going to get this out. It's so funny. When people choke, it's like, the devil's not going to stop me. I just... <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Number one, God will not give you something that you're not ready for. Or let me say it like this. You get a journey before you get the thing that you're praying about. And I want to explain that to you in just in a moment. Stay with me. This, this may, see, our frustration with God gets misguided because the delay is usually not him, but the curriculum that God has us in. See, God is a father, and he won't give you a position or a possession that you will eventually lose through immaturity. Let me say that again. God is a father, and he will not give you a position or a possession that you could lose through your own immaturity. Because to God, it's sabotage. So when you ask God, ask it's not the thing you get. Here it comes. It's not the thing you get, but it's the journey you get to get you ready for what you've asked God for. It's the maturity journey. See, we go, God, I, I want to be a senior pastor. Ooh, that's the worst prayer. I'll tell you that right now. Because you don't get a church, you get the maturity journey to get you ready for leading that. See, we're upset because no one's calling us, going like, I got a fire on my bones, I'm ready to preach, and I'm ready to do it. And God goes, no, 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 no. If I give you a position or a possession, but you don't have the maturity, you're gonna, it's going to be sabotage. So when you ask God for something, he'll give you the maturity journey to get you ready for the thing that you've asked. That's why there's a length of time between ask and receive. You can ask, but what happens next is God's school of maturity so you can handle what you've asked for. It's the difference between what I want and when you're ready for it. That's what God begins to do. See, God's school is so different than any one of us could imagine. A man that has affected both Gary's life and Pastor Carter's life and my life is, is a man that has now been with the Lord, Leonard Ravenhill, who said these words. Listen to these words. Drop this down. He said, he said, ministers prepare for three years and preach for 30. Jesus prepared for 30 and preached three. Because it's God's school is different. And, and his curriculum is different. And that's why God says, what I need you to understand is, is that if you can just be faithful in the little, I can then entrust you with the ruler over much. Or let me give it to you this way. Jot this down. Big doors swing on little hinges. It's doing the little things right. So, so think about this. How do you prepare somebody to preach the second longest sermon in the Bible, which is Acts chapter 7, Stephen 
He's going to preach the second longest sermon in the Bible next to the Sermon on the Mount. How do you prepare him for that? Well, you go to, you get your MDiv, you go to Bible school, then you go to the Fire in Your Bones conference, and then all of a sudden, you got to prepare with your exegesis, then we're going to send you to this school. Isn't it amazing that God's school is totally different? So when you read about God's school, this is what God says. He says, before I can put a microphone in your hand and put you on a stage, I'm going to give you some tables with some widows, and you're going to serve food before you hold a microphone. Because if you don't know how to serve, I can't have you leading people with a microphone. Listen to, what, listen to this. And not just serving anybody. Think of the category. You're going to serve angry, hungry, old widows. My mom, who I saw last month, is 100 years old. She is 100. She just stopped driving three years ago. Three years ago. She is amazing. 100 years old, the only thing she can't do right now is hear. She just, I'm screaming the whole time. I called her up from Mother's Day. I go, this is your son. This is Tim. And she, this is the way it ended. She goes, I don't know who you are. <laughs> She goes, but thank you for calling. <laughs> that was it. And I told Cindy, I said, it counts. I called her on Mother's Day, it counts. I told her a few years ago when she was 98, I said, Mom, you're 98. Just because you think it, it doesn't mean you say it. And she is a widow. And let me just tell you something, a 98-year-old widow, and I'm just telling you, that was not only the worst thing to say, she said some things to me that just, as a result of saying that, that I'm going like, yeah, that wasn't the right thing. And this is where God goes, Stephen, if you want to hold a microphone, you're going to talk to angry, lonely, hungry widows in the church that have been overlooked, that I'm going to get you to serve tables before you get on a stage. I'm going to do some, because you're going to learn to serve. Get this, this is important. He says, I'm going to teach you to serve people that can't pay you back and can't promote you. Okay, this side got it, but this didn't. So let me just say that again. He says, I'm going to let you serve people that can't pay you back and they can't promote you. See, it's easy to serve a pastor or somebody that can put you in another different role. But what about serving people that can't pay you back for doing it and can't put you in a position that you just got to trust God to put you in the right place? That's what God does. He says, then I can entrust you to preach the second longest sermon. He said, I don't need your exegesis. I don't need you to go through homiletics or hermeneutics. I just need you to serve widows. That Acts 6 will become your curriculum to get you ready for that. That's what's in between Acts 6 and, and, or what's, what, what you're in between your ask and receive is going to be widows and tables, Stephen, before you receive a microphone in your hand and the, and the leadership to preach and really having the, 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 the prestige of being known as the first martyr, not only of the church, but it's your martyrdom that is going to literally be a prick in the side of the apostle Paul, a goad that's going to begin to bring him to, 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 to faith, that you're not even going to know this, Stephen, until you get to heaven. You're going to have the distinct honor, Stephen, of Christ standing at your entrance into heaven that the seated Christ will become the standing Christ because you did it the right way. But I don't have my MDiv, I, don't have, I, I, I didn't get my master's, I didn't go to Bible school, but you served faithfully tables and did exactly what I've asked you to do. That's why if you're sitting here today and you're going like, man, they just have me ushering, or I'm dealing with children, or I should be preaching. I, I, whatever God has you doing, it, it doesn't matter whether you're ushering and you're going, but I've got preaching me. Then, then preach to the cars as they come in. Park your car huh, right here in this spot. You can go ahead. Talk to those children. Preach to the children. Say, turn children in your Bibles. And we're going to. Then if it's there, it works everywhere. It doesn't matter. You don't need a stage for the gift of God. If you're called to dream, isn't it amazing? You can tell your brothers, Joseph, about the dream, but if it's the real gift, it still works in prison when you don't have a business card, a website to tell everybody else that you're a dreamer. It works in every single place. So if your gift doesn't work in children's ministry, you may not have the gift. I thought to myself when Gary was speaking, going, this is the only conference where he's telling people to quit the ministry. <laughs> God is so smart, 
that he will always show you the end, but never the process. You'll know the receive, but you won't know the process. My friend who preached last night at Times Square Church, 85 years old, Dr. R.T. Kendall from Westminster Chapel in London said this, God help the man who's, here it comes, promoted before his time. God help the man who's promoted before his time. Let me age myself twice before I get to the second part and share with you about this ask and receive that God is a father and knows the timing. Um, my father that Gary was talking about was my hero. New York City, Brooklyn born. He was police chief of the transit police in New York City and godly man, godly man. I'm so thankful for my dad who's with Jesus now. But I remember when I turned 17, my dad told me, he says, I'm gonna buy you your first car. And what he bought me was not what I thought I should receive. <laughs> so here's my first aging of myself. He bought me, it has to be the largest production car in American history. It's called the Ford LTD Brome. How many have heard of an LTD? Okay, if you haven't, it's about the size of the stage. That's the size of the car. That's what he bought me. Guess who wasn't getting a date to prom? Guess who wasn't? I'm driving this thing. Everybody else's parents are buying. My dad buys me an LTD Brome. You need two spots to park it. It's, it, it, it can run over stuff, and you wouldn't even know it. I could have run over small children. I have no idea. It was huge. I had a, it had an AM radio, and it was, it was you remember the cars, it's the, it's the bench seats. I mean, remember that? It, there was no, it was like, in order, everybody had to move up together, remember those seats? And if somebody didn't, it would click, and you're going, hey, come on, we gotta move together. Unity, one in Christ. Huge, LTD Brome. Let me age myself a second time. Let me tell you what I feel like my dad was supposed to buy me. There was a movie that came out with Burt Reynolds and Sally Fields. Oh, you didn't watch the Grammys, but you saw Smokey and the Bandit, huh? <laughs> he had this Trans Am with this bird, this, this phoenix on the front, a teat. That's what God wanted me to have. That was the car. That's the one that God said, yes, I will anoint you in the Trans Am, but not the LTD. And, and I, as, he gave, as my dad gave me this, what my dad was telling me was this. He was saying, I'm giving you an LTD to see if you can pay the LTD tickets for all the parking tickets to see if you know how to change the oil on the LTD and if you can upkeep it before you can even handle a Trans Am. That what God does sometimes is some of you are all upset with your LTD ministry that you're praying for Trans Am and God goes, wait a second, if you can't be faithful with the LTD, I can't put something else in your hands. L listen, let, let's, let's take this another way. How about, how about this? This, this will really get, it's, it's, it's God beginning to go, if you can't tithe on your LTD salary, how then do you think you're going to tithe when God gives you a Trans Am salary? Because if you can't be faithful in what you have, you won't be faithful what God can give you because he's bringing you through a school of maturity. How, how about this? How about this? People that are, that are still praying for a husband or, a, or, a, or, a, or marriage and they're going, God, I want to be married. I want to be married. I want to be married. But, but here's what I realized. God, I didn't get married till I was 33, but here's what I realized in between my ask and receive. God was asking for faithfulness and purity during my single years. And here's what's incredible. Take the worst single person in human history history. Ready for this? Adam. 
There's no other humans. How do you get a date? Adam can't even meet anybody. There is no e-harmony or, or, or Christian mingle. He has nobody. He can put in, I like rainbows in the Bible and, and I like ponies and nobody's responding because, because no one existed. But here's what I learned. When God says you're ready, he can make a woman out of nothing and do exactly what he wants to do. But God says you gotta take care of your LTD single life before I give you a trans am man. Because if you can't be satisfied in God, you won't be set, then you're gonna look to people to do what only God can do for you, and that's the danger. Our satisfaction has to be in God and God alone. Delay is not denial. We ask God how come, and God says, of course, I need you to grow. Delay is not God's inability, it's our immaturity. Some point, maybe, not today, I'll tell you the story. When God spoke to Pastor Carter, when I was supposed to come to Times Square Church, but he couldn't tell me because God had to put me through a school. A school that would deepen me, a school. I, I will tell you this, the school took, took 10 years. 10 years. And it wasn't delay, it was immaturity. It was a deepening work that God needed to do. And that's what happens. God begins, the first part, what's in between ask and receive, is a school called maturity. And it's not God's inability, it's God growing us. God, grow us, grow us, grow us, so we don't sabotage. You're a father, and fathers won't give us a position or a possession that will sabotage with our immaturity. It's a, it's, we don't get the thing, we get the journey to deepen us in God. Does that make sense? Okay, second thing and then we close, but it's don't, no musicians come up. It's a long closing. <laughs> I was going, let's go. Let's go. Let's stay. Let's stay okay, we gotta do this. Here we go. Number two, and this is the part that, that liberated me. You pray, write this down. You pray one thing God does 10,000 things. You pray one thing, God does 10,000 things. Now stay with me and I want to explain this. This is what liberated me between ask and receive. This was the fire in my bones. This is God synchronizing and coordinating from the woman or the man that prays. We have no idea what God does to answer prayer. He puts 10,000 things into motion and all you did was ask. I, 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 forgive me for going back to this. This is my mind. I was thinking through that crazy movie when, when Morgan Freeman is God in Bruce Almighty and then Jim Carrey is, gets to be God for a couple days and in his mind, he's hearing all these people go, I want this, I want this, and five million requests. And there's one moment he just hits yes. He just goes, yes, to everybody. And then you see all this stuff come up in the newspaper. One of them says, um, lottery is won by three million people. Everybody got a dollar fifty. And so that was one of them. <laughs> And then there was another one that just that Jim Carrey was going like, I want to, I want a full moon when I when I propose. And Jim Carrey is, is stretching out the moon. And then the next day in the paper it says tsunami hits the Philippines for strange move moon moon uh, uh, um, uh, movements. And, and so you think it's you. So you're going like, it's difficult to be God because you have to realize how many things are being put into motion. You did the easy thing, you asked. God is the one that's doing the 10,000 things. All you did was ask. What, what do you mean, Pastor Tim? Let me, I wanna use my new friend that we just meet, Ron Brown. I just, Ron, I was, and I just met for the first time, I would hear about Ron, and so let me use Ron for a second that, that helped with, with the, this conference. Let, let's say Ron came in here today, and maybe this is the word Ron needed to hear. Let's say Ron is coming from the parking lot and Ron just goes, I need a word from the Lord. That's all he did. That was ask. I need God to speak to me. That's all Ron did. So Ron just whispers it to God 
Do you understand what God had to do to answer that prayer? Because God knew that Ron, in God's omniscience, he knew that Ron would walk from that parking lot, whisper that prayer, but he had to put 10,000 things to answer that prayer. If this is the message Ron Brown needed to hear to keep him going, to keep the fire in his, in his bones, if this was the message, do you understand? Because God knew the end from the beginning. He knew, see, some of you are going like, well, you were in your room and you were praying and God just gave you this word. It's deeper than that. It had to go all the way back to 1950s when David Wilkerson is, decides to put away his TV and says, I'm not going to watch TV anymore. I'm going to start to pray. And then all of a sudden, a Life magazine comes with these, with these gang members from the Dragons. They're about to be put on trial. And David goes, I'm going to go to New York City and doesn't even meet the, the gang members, but meets Nikki Cruz on the streets of Brooklyn. But happens on that day to have a police officer walking the beat, Captain Paul Delina, that seems to connect with all of a sudden, they, David Wilkerson and, and David Wilkerson and Paul Delina connect on that street and said, hey, well, I got a great idea. Let's start a team challenge. So my dad, Paul, would you become the first treasurer? We'll start the team challenge. And so a team challenge starts on Clinton Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. And then all of a sudden, God starts to expand the vision. And now team challenge all over the world. But God has to do something in Ron to get him to team challenge. But that's not done. I have to go to a conference in Fort Worth, Texas to be told, go with Gary to Detroit, Michigan, so you guys can be working together. And then after us are working together, Gary has to have the vision after his dad's passing to start a conferences all over the world. And then all of a sudden he goes, let's start one in San Diego. So we come to San Diego and all of a sudden Gary goes, let me get Tim to do the, 10, the, the 11 o'clock session. But I need to make sure I clear Ron's schedule so he's here on that very day. I need to clear Tim's schedule in New York City so he can say yes to Gary. Ron can be here because David Wilkerson decided not to watch TV and so God had to put 10,000 things and he has the audacity to say I need a word from God God goes I will do 10,000 things to get a word to you while you're complaining he's coordinating while you're complaining he's synchronizing while you're complaining, God is doing 10,000 things. Now a piano player can come. So here's how we end. Gary alluded to this. Dr. Teresa Conlon, Pastor Carter's wife, leads our Bible school, Summit International School of the Ministry. It's training the next generation. And Pastor Carter was the one that had this dream and it just flooded my heart. He goes, I have, I have 25,000 books in my library and if you live in a New York City apartment, that would, I'd have to get rid of my four kids <laughs> in order to keep the books. So God began to put it on, and, and I didn't realize that in my single years, God was going, I don't want you dating anybody and going out with anybody. I want you buying books. And God, I used all those resources for that. So in Grantville, Penn, Pennsylvania, on a Bible school that David Wilkerson started, that Dr. Teresa Conlon leads, with 70% of that Bible school is international students, Pastor Carter goes, let's build a library in memory of the day that your dad said, let the man preach, that we're gonna put on the cornerstone. We haven't built it yet. We just said, let's prayerfully wait for the right time and we'd erect and put all those 25,000 books in there to train the next generation. Of all those books, there's only one, there's, well, I remember two books that have made me cry, that literally you could see tears on the pages. I'm not saying this to boast. I'm just saying that it's a rare thing that I'm reading a book and I wept over it. I've been always a C.S. Lewis fan. So I, I, I wept. I literally wept when I was reading Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I came to that part, Kelly, that 
when, when Aslan shows up at the witch's castle and starts breathing on these statues of people that she has frozen and made stone. And the way that Lewis wrote it just made me cry. I was just thinking that the, the, the who represents Christ, he started breathing on them. And then stone started to become flesh again. It was just the way he wrote it. I just, it moved me. But the one that moved me probably even more is one of my, I get asked by people all the time. They said, what's your favorite book of 25,000 books? Everyone's going, say the cross on the switchblade. And I love the cross on the switchblade. <laughs> But it's, it's a toss-up. It's either Pilgrim's Progress, but the other one is this. And this is the one, as you stand, I'm going to tell you what it is. Stand with me, because I'm going to teach you a prayer from the book. It's a book you can get for free. It's written probably 700, almost 700 years ago, and it's simply called Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. It's just his devotional life. It's his prayers. Thomas Akempis prayed something in this book. I'm going to teach you a one-sentence prayer. He prayed something that so moved me that I literally I threw the book down and I go, I can't, I can't do this. And it got me through ask and receive. It got me through what's in between ask and receive. And Thomas Akempis prayed this prayer. Let me teach it to you. And it's just simply this. Here are the words. He said, Lord, here it comes. You serve me more than I serve you. Think of that for just a moment. Let it, let it stick in you. Lord, you serve me more than I serve you. How countercultural is that? Because the higher you get in our society, the more you have people, let me carry this, let me do this, let me open the door, let me do all this stuff, which I'm not, I'm not saying is wrong. I, I appreciate that. But to have the king of the universe say, I serve you more than you serve me. You know what that means? He's working 10,000 things on my behalf that I may not know what he's doing, but it got me through what's in between ask and receive. Lord, you serve me more than I serve you. What a huge thought. I ask, he does 10,000 things I receive. Folks, what an imbalance. All I do is ask, and he works on my behalf, and I'm complaining? You're not fast enough. Jeremiah, I don't like people, and I don't understand you. John the Baptist, are you really the one supposed to come? I know what I said in John chapter 1, but Matthew 11, I'm just not sure. Prison is making me rethink this thing. Folks, you think prayer is work. Try being God. <laughs> Can I tell you what my prayer is now when I'm in between ask and receive? This is my prayer now. God, grow me and do your 10,000 things. God, grow me and do your 10,000 things. God, grow me and do your 10,000 things. Just for a moment, would you just lift your hands just right where you're at as we close? And as you lift your hands, would you just... Whether you want to say them out loud or whisper, would you just say, God, grow me? Tell them right now. Just say, God, grow me. And, and say, God, do your 10,000 things. God, grow me. And do your 10,000 things. That while I'm complaining, you're coordinating. While I'm upset, oh God, I just pray that you would just grow me. Lord, in this school, I don't know when the school's over, and I don't know if you're up to, up to 9,500 of all the things you're doing, but we just say today as leaders in your church, grow us and do your 10,000 things, oh God. So many of us are in between ask and receive, and so Lord, today, show us, Lord God, that it's that fire in our bones that hold us when everything else upsets us, Lord God. When nothing looks like, like it's supposed to look. And so, God, I'm just asking you just to come and do something special. Now, folks, let me just say this, and I'm going to give it back over to Kelly. To Kelly, listen, listen to this. I just read this, that the fastest animal on the planet is the cheetah, 70 miles per hour. And this is what it says. It says when it's running after its prey, there's a little... It has to catch the prey quickly. Here it comes. Because its heart is so small. 
They said if it runs for a length of time, they said it'll have a heart attack and it'll die trying to catch its prey. That is why you see them run and stop because their heart's not big enough to keep them going. And all I thought about was Galatians 6, 9. God, let us not lose heart in doing good for in due time you will reap if you don't grow weary. If you don't grow weary. You know what you're, you know what you're saying? God, enlarge my heart right now. Can we just ask him? God, we, we, we just give his heart. Let's not get weary in well-doing. And I'm praying for these precious leaders today. Let them not get weary. Enlarge their heart between ask and receive. And so God, today, encourage and let them know that you're growing us, you're doing your 10,000 things, and in the middle of all that, give us a big heart that will not grow weary.